Psalm 75. For the director of music to the tune of Do Not Destroy, a psalm of Asaph, a song. We praise you, God. We praise you, for your name is near. People tell of your wonderful deeds. You say, I choose the appointed time. It is I who judge with equity. When the earth and all its people quake, it is I who hold its pillars firm. To the arrogant, I say, boast no more, and to the wicked, do not lift up your horns. Do not lift your horns against heaven. Do not speak so defiantly. No one from the east or the west or from the desert can exalt themselves. It is God who judges. He brings one down. He exalts another. In the hand of the Lord is a cup full of foaming wine mixed with spices. He pours it out, and all the wicked of the earth drink it down to its very dregs. As for me, I will declare this forever. I will sing praise to the God of Jacob, who says, I will cut off the horns of all the wicked, but the horns of the righteous will be lifted up. Ezekiel 8 In the sixth year, in the sixth month, on the fifth day, while I was sitting in my house, and the elders of Judah were sitting before me, the hand of the Sovereign Lord came on me there. I looked and I saw a figure like that of a man. From what appeared to be his waist down, he was like fire, and from there up his appearance was as bright as glowing metal. He stretched out what looked like a hand and took me by the hair of my head. The Spirit lifted me up between earth and heaven, and in visions of God he took me to Jerusalem to the entrance of the north gate of the inner court, where the idol that provokes to jealousy stood. And there before me was the glory of the God of Israel, as in the vision I had seen in the plain. Then he said to me, Son of man, look toward the north. So I looked, and in the entrance north of the gate of the altar I saw this idol of jealousy. And he said to me, Son of man, do you see what they are doing, the utterly detestable things the Israelites are doing here, things that will drive me far from my sanctuary? But you will see things that are even more detestable. Then he brought me to the entrance to the court. I looked, and I saw a hole in the wall. He said to me, Son of man, now dig into the wall. So I dug into the wall, and saw a doorway there. And he said to me, Go in and see the wicked and detestable things they are doing here. So I went in and looked, and I saw portrayed all over the walls all kinds of crawling things, and unclean animals, and all the idols of Israel. In front of them stood seventy elders of Israel, and Jazaniah, son of Shaphan, was standing among them. Each had a censer in his hand, and a fragrant cloud of incense was rising. He said to me, Son of man, have you seen what the elders of Israel are doing in the darkness, each at the shrine of his own idol? They say, The Lord does not see us. The Lord has forsaken the land. Again he said, You will see them doing things that are even more detestable. Then he brought me to the entrance of the north gate of the house of the Lord, and I saw women sitting there, mourning the god Tamaz. He said to me, Do you see this, son of man? You will see things that are even more detestable than this. He then brought me into the inner court of the house of the Lord, and there at the entrance to the temple between the portico and the altar were about twenty-five men with their backs toward the temple of the Lord and their faces toward the east. They were bowing down to the sun in the east. He said to me, Have you seen this, son of man? Is it a trivial matter for the people of Judah to do the detestable things they are doing here? Must they also fill the land with violence and continually arouse my anger? Look at them putting the branch to their nose. Therefore I will deal with them in anger. I will not look on them with pity or spare them. Although they shout in my ears, I will not listen to them. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them false. You have persevered, 
and have endured hardships for my name, and have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent, and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. To the angel of the church in Smyrna, write, These are the words of him who is the first and the last, who died and came to life again. I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. I know about the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for ten days. Be faithful, even to the point of death, and I will give you life as your victor's crown. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who is victorious will not be hurt at all by the second death. To the angel of the church in Pergamum write, these are the words of him who has the sharp, double-edged sword. I know where you live, where Satan has his throne. Yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me, not even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness who was put to death in your city where Satan lives. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. There are some among you who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin so that they ate food sacrificed to idols and committed sexual immorality. Likewise, you also have those who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Repent, therefore, otherwise I will soon come to you, and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will also give that person a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to the one who receives it. To the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These are the words of the Son of God, whose eyes are like blazing fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your deeds, your love and faith, your service and perseverance, and that you are now doing more than you did at first. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophet. By her teaching she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering, and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely, unless they repent of her ways." I will strike her children dead. Then all the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds, and I will repay each of you according to your deeds. Now I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, to you who do not hold to her teaching and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets, I will not impose any other burden on you except to hold on to what you have until I come to the one who is victorious and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. That one will rule them with an iron scepter and will dash them to pieces like pottery, just as I have received authority from my Father. I will also give that one the morning star. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Hello everyone, thank you for tuning in to Beauty and Brokenness. My name is Crystal and today I am coming to you with a message concerning idols, repentance, and judgment. And I actually had a dream on May the 30th uh, that led me to Psalm 35, Ezekiel 8, and Revelation 2, which you just heard. And that is basically giving you more context of what I was dreaming about. 
I definitely want to encourage you to seek the Lord in prayer concerning this message, but I do hope that someone listens with an open heart. And if you feel a conviction from the Holy Spirit, I do pray that you take heed to it and I pray that you repent. Scripture tells us that the Lord is just and faithful to forgive us of all unrighteousness and we're never too far gone for the Lord to save us. He loves every last single one of us with an everlasting love. I want you guys to always remember that. Um, I do believe we are approaching a time of great judgment from the Lord, and it's going to be something that we've never seen before. There are many of us who are just going about our daily lives, not seeking Jesus, not living for him. We're complicit in our sin, but I really do employ you to please, please, please repent. Please receive salvation through Christ Jesus. Many of us are, like the scripture says, in the last days, we're a lover of ourselves. We're arrogant, we're boastful, we're prideful, and and we're wicked. Um, And the Lord in his abundant grace and mercy has been so patient with us concerning these things. But the Lord is about to address the prideful, the wicked. He's about to address those who are refusing to repent and and those who are continuously erecting idols and leading others astray. Uh, He will definitely be raining down his judgment um, concerning those matters. And I really do think he's going to be addressing those that he's placed in positions to do his will and his work. And those people have abused their calling. They have exalted themselves. They've compromised the integrity of the gospel for likes, for money, for fame, and much more. Uh, The Lord is the one who judges. And you will see many of these people who were once in these positions be removed and the Lord is going to exalt others in their place who genuinely love the Lord, who have a heart for the Lord and who truly desire to spread the gospel in this true context. Um, And as I stated, I was led to Psalm 75 in my dream. I also received the revelation of the word Victor in my dream. And when I typed in the word Victor in the Bible app, I was led to Revelation 2.10 that was highlighted to me. But when I began to read the entire chapter, I saw that the Lord was not only addressing those who don't know Christ, but those who are believers as well. And the biblical meaning of Victor actually means conqueror. And when you read Revelation 2.10, it makes sense. It says, do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you that the devil will put some of you in prison to test you and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Be faithful, even to the point of death. And I will give you life as your victor's crown. I want to share something with you guys. Those who are not believers, those who are believers. Something that I wish someone really would have told me is as believers, no matter what. And no matter where we are, we are going to endure suffering and persecution. Scripture tells us that there's nowhere in the Bible that says that we won't endure those things. And there are believers in other countries who are being exiled, who are being disowned. Some are even being martyred because of their faith in Jesus Christ. So I don't want you to think that you are an exception. Many tend to lose faith in God and and decide not to, to go on this walk with Jesus anymore because no one properly and in true biblical context set their expectation on what's going to happen when you become a believer. The first thing is you are going to be persecuted. You see it now as many more believers who are becoming more bold and standing on the word of God, how we're not wavering or watering down the gospel to appease the masses. And because we aren't, we're being persecuted. You're going to be persecuted. That that's going to happen. Jesus said to John 15, if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. So you have to expect that you would be hated. And I also need you to understand that despite the persecution, despite the hate and the suffering, you are also loved. You're loved by others and more importantly, you're loved by God. And that love hits different. That's a different kind of love. He loves you with an everlasting love. And you have to have solace and peace in that. You have to find courage and strength in that. You have to find your validation and purpose in that. Jesus was persecuted. He was mocked. He was beaten. He was killed. Our persecution and suffering may not be to that literal extent, but expect as followers of Christ, we will partake in his sufferings. 
That's why it says in 1 Peter 4, 16, that however, if you suffer as a Christian, don't be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. And I'm sure that's why Christ encourages us in Revelations 2 to be faithful, no matter the outcome, even if it's unto death, because in the end, we will come out conquerors. We will come out with the crown of victory. And there are so many stories in the Bible that talk about persecution. But I think as a believer, especially in this season where I feel like idols that have been erected due to our rebellion and sin are now coming down, it would be a great idea to meditate on Acts 18. Um, that scripture talks about Paul and the, his two companions who went to preach in, uh, to the Ephesians in Ephesus. And there was this silversmith named Demetrius who made idol shrines and wanted to rise up against Paul and his companions with many others because a lot of the Ephesians that, that Paul was ministering to, they were turning from pagan practices and following Christ. And Demetrius actually said in 18, uh, Acts 18, 27, that, you know, there's a danger not only to our trade will lose its good name, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis will be discredited. And in verse 26 of Acts, he says that Paul had convinced and led a large number of people to Christ, not only in Ephesus, but practically in in the whole province of Asia, because that's the charge that we were given. That's one of the, you know, the biggest charges outside of loving God and loving others is to make disciples of nations. So if you're on the track to doing what the Lord is calling you to do, and you're having that huge of an impact, I need you to know that you're going to come up against huge persecution and, and huge uh, backlash. You know, Paul was teaching them at that time that the gods that were made by human hands were not gods at all. And I believe as believers, the more we become more vocal about idolatry, we have to expect those who uphold their idols to buck against us and they're going to buck against us hard. You see it now with all of these uh, denouncement and renouncement videos from these D9 and Greek organizations. And as you continue to read Revelations 2, you will also see that Jesus is addressing multiple churches. You know, he acknowledges the parts of their faith that align with God and what God has in instru has instructed them to do. But he also addresses the areas that he's not happy about. Very much like the body of Christ today. I remember I used to be a person who didn't take correction well when it came to my faith. But now I understand that that was just pride. And all of us, no matter who we are, no matter what gifts we have, no matter what office we operate in, we should be able to humble ourselves enough to be corrected in love. Because that's what Galatians 6 and 1 tells us. It says that if someone is caught in sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves or you also may be tempted. Um, there are many, many people in the body of Christ. I really feel this, that we genuinely do love the Lord. We genuinely do desire to please him and live for Jesus. And I want you to know that he sees that. He sees those who are working and doing the work of the Lord. He sees the ones who address and acknowledge and the calling out of false teachers and apostles and, apostles and prophets. Um, he sees the backlash that we receive for standing on the irrevocable word of God. He sees those who are being afflicted. He sees those who are dealing with poverty. He sees those who are making daily decisions to pick up the cross and bear it. And in your enduring, you need to know that you are rich in Christ Jesus. No matter what, you are rich in Christ Jesus. I need you to know that he sees those who are professing to be Christians, but really aren't Christians. They're working for the enemy. He sees those who are suffering and going through persecution in the name of Jesus Christ. He sees the people who are standing steadfast in their faith and their convictions and those who aren't backing down no matter what. He sees those people. He sees the ones that did denounce their faith when things got hard. He sees the ones that are witnessing and testifying of the gospel of Christ Jesus and doing it in the midst of of living in a time where principalities and strongholds are running rampant over entire nations. And we're living in a time when evil is being glorified and what's God and holy is being crucified. He sees your God, your godly deeds. He sees your love. He sees your faith. He sees your perseverance. He sees your growth and your maturity and your relationship with him. He sees all of those great things. But just like back then, I need you to know now that the Lord is also calling us to be aware of the things in our lives that are not rooted in God, that don't bring him glory. There is an infection in the body of Christ. And the only cure is Christ. 
But the root of it is us. You have to deal with the root first. We have to deal with our sins as individuals, the shortcomings in our lives. And on up to those, we need to surrender those things to God, those things that are contributing to the illness to the body of Christ. For example, some of us have gotten off track. We've made the gift and the calling an idol in our lives and we've forsaken the one who was the gift giver and the one who has called us. We don't worship like we used to. We don't pray like we used to. We don't fast like we used to. We don't get into the world like we used to. We've forsaken our first love. And there are things that we do that aren't of God and we know it. And every time we do it, I'm pretty sure a lot of us, even if for a split second, we get that feeling of conviction from the Holy Spirit, but yet we still to proceed to engage in that sin. We have to repent, which means we have to turn away from that sin. Some of us, we, we lack humbleness. We lack, the, uh, we lack the ability to look into the mirror and see our flaws. We lack the ability to receive that rebuke from our brothers and uh, sisters in Christ and in love. And when we do that, we're actually glorifying the enemy because we have become uh, beyond reproach. Especially if the Lord has called you to be a teacher or a prophet or apostle or or whatever. It's like Leviticus, excuse me, it's like Revelations 2 tells us that he will remove your lampstand from its place. Uh, maybe you're making yourself the focal point instead of making Jesus the focal point. And that goes back to Psalm 75 and 7 when the Lord says he is the judge who brings one down and he exalts another. He will bring you down and he will exalt someone else in your place to carry out his will because his will is going to be done no matter what. He wants someone who is in alignment with holiness, the holiness that he's calling us to live by because he is holy. He did it to Saul with David. And some of us. We have idols in our lives. We have idols in our hearts that the Bible speaks against. And some of us have become our own idols. In Revelations 2, 6, God said, you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. So here, just like in the first six, seven books of the Old Testament, over and over and over again, we hear the Lord talk about idols and how he hates idols. God is saying in the New Testament, in fact, in Revelations, we all wait to the end now. He says he still hates idolatry. He still hates paganism. And just to give you some context about the Nicolaitans, they actually upheld the era of Balaam, who was a non-Israelite prophet that's mentioned in Numbers 22, uh, 22 through 24 or 22 through 25. Um, the king at that time, Balak of Moab, he wanted uh, Balaam to curse the Israelites and instead Balaam blessed them. And even so, Balaam is still held responsible for planning to entice the Israelites with the stumbling block of idol worship, of eating uh, food sacrificed to other gods and sexual immorality. You can actually read that in Numbers 25. But the Nicolaitans also upheld the doctrine that basically said that it was OK to have one foot in the world and one foot out. They basically uh, basically they basically was, was saying that the scripture that causes us to be separate from the world you didn't need to do that that's fine you don't have to do that that's not really necessary you're actually being too strict you know basically they were co-signing on being lukewarm and you know what the scripture says about being lukewarm he says i i'd rather you be hot or cold if you're lukewarm i'll spew you out and if you actually go to the blue letter bible app and you look up the word nicolations it actually means destruction of people so so basically, that very thing that you've made an idol, those detestable practices that you are willingly engaging in over and over again, being lukewarm, all of these will lead to your destruction. And you see it in churches today. You see where churches are allowing homosexual pastors to shepherd the churches. You see where teachers are teaching you the love of God, but they're never teaching you the wrath of God, which leaves many ignorant. And that's why a lot of people walk away from the faith because no one has taught them how to count the cost. You see a lot of syncretism going on in the church today, which is the merging of two religions and or practices. Because I've seen preachers uh, incorporate the law of attraction into their sermon or suggest a book about it, which was just wild to me. There's also a tolerance of false prophets and false prophetesses in the church 
who are operating under the spirit of error. I remember I've been listening to a lot of prophetic words in the beginning when I became a believer. And then the revelation came to me. I began to notice that I was seeking revelation from man more than I was actually seeking it from God himself. And I started to feel like I was doing the same thing I was doing in New Age by watching all those tarot readings. So I had to repent and I had to get right in that manner. Um, but there was a particular part in the scripture in um, Revelations 2 that hit me for many reasons. And it was the description of Jezebel in the church to the point that I actually had to stop studying. I had to reflect and I had to repent. I'll go ahead and read this to you. This is Revelations 2, 20 through 25. This is the NIV version. It says, nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophet. By her teaching, she misleads my service into sexual immorality and eating of food sacrificed to idols. I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely unless they repent of her ways. I will strike her children dead. Then all the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds and I will repay each of you according to your deeds. This was the part. Now I say to the rest of you in Thyteria, to you who do not hold her teachings and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets, I will not impose any other burden on you except to hold on to what you have until I come. That part hit me hard because there are a lot of false teachers, prophets, and etc. who are so skilled in what they do to the point that it's coming very difficult to detect them. There are actually some that I've stopped listening to and it's because I felt I felt something in my spirit and I was trying to see if I was actually feeling a conviction or if I was discerning something about them didn't align with the word of God. And one thing that I'm teaching myself more recently now is that I'm asking myself questions like, are they displaying a behavior that is more hyper-focused on the enemy than on the Lord? They're more focused on learning about the enemy and the spirits and the kingdom of darkness and what they do and et cetera. Now, I'm not saying that you shouldn't know what to pray against, and I'm not encouraging you to be in the dark concerning the schemes in the wiles of the enemy, especially if the Lord himself has given you a revelation of a spirit that's in your bloodline. But sometimes I just felt like I was learning more about Satan than I was learning about Jesus. And what I learned from the scriptures that false prophets just aren't those who say one thing and promote sin or sexual immorality or other pagan practices, but they are also very hyper-focused on learning the mysteries of Satan in order to defeat him. So this isn't your obvious, you know, satanic worship. This is, you know, the hyper-focus on the mysteries of Satan and the kingdom of darkness. And I wanted to get some context from the Blue Letter Bible app from some respected teachers of uh, commentary. And I actually came upon David Guzik. I think that's how you pronounce his last name. And he's someone that I love to really read when I read the Blue Letter Bible app. But this is what he said about the particular part that I mentioned to you. So he basically was talking about that later in the letter that Jesus was also revealing the link of the Jezebel's false doctrine and things that she was teaching concerning the depths of Satan and in this particular church. And he also made mention of that, you know, in this particular time in the in the days of the New Testament, there was like non-religious group who claimed to know the deep things of Satan. And there was this writer who asked that if you ask some of these group about their cosmic mysteries, they will furrow their brows and they will say it is deep. But it may be deep, but he said it is deep into a dangerous pit. And the one part that really stuck out to me when he was addressing that scripture was he said, how could Christians ever fall for the depths of Satan? Perhaps the deceptive reasoning went this way to effectively confront Satan. You must enter his strongholds and learn his depths in order to conquer him. People use similar reasoning and misguided spiritual warfare today. Again, it was that last part that hit me. This is part of what he said. He said, what Christ called them depths of Satan, satanical delusions and devices, diabolical mysteries, for there is a mystery of iniquity as well and the great mystery of godliness. It is a dangerous thing to despise the mystery of God, and it is a dangerous thing to receive the mysteries of Satan. How tender Christ of his faithful service, I will lay upon you no more 
burdens, but that which you have already hold fast till I come. That's pertaining to verse 24, 25. I will not overburden you. Uh, excuse me. I will not overburden your faith with new mysteries, nor your consciousness with any new laws. I only require your attention to what you have received. Hold fast till I come and I desire no more. And I can now look back. And see during some of the learning that I did from certain teachers and prophets and things of that nature, how hyper focused they were on the enemy and evil spirits and and tearing down altars and etc. They spent most of their teachings on that than they did on Jesus and the power of his blood. So in my mind, I'm thinking that, okay, I have deeper knowledge, right? I have deeper knowledge because I'm learning this stuff from these the experienced teachers and prophets, but also too, um, I was in new age. So there might be some things that I might be more privy to in regards to how the enemy works. And I'm not saying that that's not necessarily true, but what I'm saying is I just became hyper-focused on that. And I feel that you run more into this danger in charismatic churches um, and on and online, on YouTube, on social media. And what you really should be doing and what you really want to do is ask the Lord to help you discern what is him and what isn't him. Like, for example, you see some of these people who claim to be prophets and prophetess and they have a prophetic message 12 times a day, every day. You really should be praying and asking the Lord God, is this you? And don't get me wrong. The fivefold ministry is essential. If you go to 1 Corinthians 12, 28, it says that God placed in the church first all the apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then fits of healing, of helping, of guidance, and of different kinds of tongue. If you go to Ephesians 4 and 11, it says Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers. So every believer, every apostle, every prophet, every evangelist, every pastor, every teacher make up the body of Christ, they play a part in the body of Christ. All are essential for his function by the power of the Holy Spirit. So I don't want you to think that I'm talking down on fivefold ministries. I think that they are essential. Um, there are a lot of churches who don't uphold this. And, you know, you see it. You see the, you see the lack in that church. But there are also some very charismatic churches who focus solely on this, focus on the gifts and not the message of, and the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's also a problem too. The danger lies when those who profess to hold these titles aren't actually called, nor are they of God. They're operating in a spirit of error. You know, there's the spirit of truth, which is the Holy Spirit. And there's the spirit of error, which is from the kingdom of darkness. Now, there are some who are actually called. There are some who are actually called, but somehow along the way, they lost their way. Both need to be prayed for. So just be extremely mindful of what you're taking in regarding teachings and beliefs and practices from anyone who's professing to teach the word of God or give you revelations from God. Because if you come into agreement with these these teachings and their false teachings and their false doctrines, that can cause you to commit spiritual adultery. That's why you have to test every spirit. Read the word for yourself. Ask the Holy Spirit for revelation concerning the word of God. He'll give it to you. Examine everyone by their fruit. And I'm not talking about financial wealth. I'm not talking about the materialistic things that they own. I'm not talking about them being millionaires. I'm talking about their spiritual fruit. Do they have self-control? Are they forgiving? Are they kind? Are they gentle? Are they full of love, like joy, etc.? Scripture says that we overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony, not a vast knowledge of Satan in the kingdom of darkness. And that's the error. That's the problem. A lot of times these teachings teach you the more you know about the kingdom of darkness, the more you can overtake it. And you can't do anything by yourself. It's not by your might nor by your power, but by the spirit of the living God that you can do anything that you can even pray The reason I want to make a distinction between hyper focus on all things Satan is because at one point I found myself watching videos and learning more about Satan and evil spirits and etc. to combat the enemy. When I should have been more focused on the power of God and the blood of Jesus Christ and his Holy Spirit staying booted up in the armor of God. These are my weapons against spiritual warfare. I should have been trying to become more of an expert in the things of God and who he is and how he's powerful and how the battle is already won. Those are the things that I should have been hyper-focused on. But again, I wanted to, to emphasize 
It's not knowing how to defeat the enemy. It's the hyper focus on the kingdom of darkness. Because there's also a different spectrum of this. There's some believers who don't believe in curses. They don't believe that cursed objects still exist. I'm actually going to do a video about that soon. So stay tuned for that. But I just wanted to let you know there's two different sides of the spectrum. And both are dangerous if you're on the very, very end of them. But I felt that making that distinction was very important. Because maybe you see yourself in my experience today. And this is something that you can take to the Lord in prayer and ask him to help you with. But when the scripture had also mentioned about casting uh, that Jezebel on her bed of suffering and also making those who commit adultery with her to suffer as well, unless they repent of their ways. That's why I mentioned to be careful about coming in agreement with these false teachings and these false doctrines, because you'll just be you'll be held just as guilty as the person who taught it to you. If you're taking it in, not only that, if you're living it out, not only that, if you're telling people more about it, if you're telling other people about it. You will suffer in the way that they suffer. And I don't know about you, but I'm not trying to be linked up or locked in with anyone or any teaching that goes against the word of God. And then I also mentioned about Ezekiel 8. And if you get an opportunity to read uh, Ezekiel 33, please do that. But I want to say something to all the watchmen that the Lord has called during this time. I would encourage you to get in your secret place, to spend time with the Lord, to fast and to pray. Because the Lord has been sending his watchmen to release the word of idolatry in the temple. And you ask, well, where is the temple? Well, wherever you are, you're the temple, right? That's what 1 Corinthians 6 talks about. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received of God? You are the temple. So anything that you hold as an idol in your heart, that's in the temple of God that houses the Holy Spirit if you're a believer. And I need you to know that, and I've said this before, that God will not be mocked. He is going to continue to expose uh, all your idols. He's going to continue to expose the many who have exalted themselves in every, not just in you know the church, but those in entertainment and just around you. You're going to see a lot of people being exposed and he's going to rain down his righteous judgment. People in high political places, he's going to rain down his righteous judgment. No, it doesn't matter who you are, where you are, what you do. No one is above God's judgment. If you read Ezekiel 8, it's the exposure of idols and it's provoking God because there is no repentance whatsoever in it. And this is relevant and prevalent for today. God is not going to continue to put up with our idols any longer. And yes, there are some idols that are being torn down, but there are also other idols being erected every single day. Many have taken the word of God and remixed it. They've watered it down. They've taken away from it. They're rebuking the word. They're merging it with pagan practices and all of these other detestable things to God. All of these are detestable. And people who are believers who are doing and living another way behind closed doors, they also will be exposed. Those who've been called but have erected the idol of fame and money and power above the gospel, they will fall. And here is something that stood out to me. When I read Ezekiel 8, 14, it mentions the God Tammuz. And I think, uh, I think that's how you pronounce it. But what I did some research, I learned this is a Greek idol or the Greek Adonis. And if you look at the Hebrew calendar, you will see that Tammuz, which is the Babylonian name for this month, it actually runs from June to July. And it's also known as the month of sin of the golden calf, which was an idol that resulted of the breaking of tablets of the Ten Commandments by Moses. So you see how God is really trying to address the idols in our lives. We are currently in that time frame where we see so many idols that, are, that have been erected. Again, we see idols in our daily lives. We see idols concerning social media. We are lovers of selves. We see idols in entertainment. We see idols in the church. We see idols in political high places. Like it's everywhere. We've made idols. But this is the time that we have to be vigilant in prayer. We have to be vigilant in our word. We have to be vigilant in fasting. And if you read Ezekiel 8, uh, 16, 
It makes mention of men turning their backs towards the temple of God and facing eastward to bow down and pray towards the sun or pray towards the east. Who else does that? Who else prays towards the east? Muslims. So again, this is another idol. All these other religions who Buddha, all of them. Your idols will fall. The Lord is going to tear down every idol that has been erected against him. And everyone who does not repent and turn from their evil ways and or cast down their idols, the Lord will deal with you as well. And I pray that you take heed to this message. And I pray that you repent. I pray that you go to the Lord with this word. I pray that you give your life to Jesus. God is patient in dealing with us because he wishes for none of us to perish, but all of us to come to repentance. But if you don't, I need you to really focus in on Ezekiel 8.18. If you have no desire to repent, if you have no desire to give your life to the Lord, if you have no remorse about living in sin, God says that he will deal with you in anger and he will not look with you and he will not look on you with pity. He will not spare you. And even when you shout in his ears, he will not listen. I want you guys, if you get an opportunity, go to Amazon, wherever you go to shop for books, go to your local library. And I want you to purchase or check out the book called Placebo. It's by Howard Pittman. It's a very short read. It's a great read. And it aligns with this message today. Do not be fooled by the enemy. Do not be deceived by this watered down gospel. Yes, God is a God of love, but he's also a God of wrath. He's a God of judgment. I pray that this message blesses you. Have a great day.